Welcome. I am Wizzy Brown, and I am an Extension Program Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and I am going to be talking to you about IPM Basics today. So for those of you that may not know, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. So we're going to be talking about that in relation to not only outdoor pests, but also those that are indoors. So when we look at IPM, it is a little bit different than just a traditional kind of the old school, what we call pesticide treatments, where people would come in and just spray around the baseboards. With IPM, you really need to have a little bit more knowledge of the system, which is why you are attending classes like this. And that knowledge is going to help you be able to tell whether something is a pest or a beneficial insect or if it just is something that happens to be in a particular location, because we do get that a lot of times, especially in homes, we have insects or other arthropods that move indoors at certain times of the year. And it's not that they're harming anything. It's just that they're in a location where people don't want them. So you may need to have that information about insects. You may need, if you're doing landscape stuff, to also have information about the different plants so you can actually talk with your customers in regards to if those plants are in proper locations. Because if you don't have plants in the right locations, then they're not going to be happy and healthy, and that can lead to more pest issues. You also are going to need to think about control strategies with an IPM program. While it does have pesticides in the program, we don't rely on them as heavily as we would in a traditional kind of old school pest control service. So with IPM, pesticides are typically used as a last resort. And then when we're doing that, we want to make sure that we are using reduced impact products and that we are going to target those treatments into the areas where we actually need them to be utilized. The other thing that you may need to communicate with your customers, and this may be a hard sell for some people, is that when we're using IPM, it does not mean that there are going to be zero pests. We are going to need to have some level of being okay with insects and other arthropods in the environment, especially if we're talking about in landscapes. In homes, it's a little bit different because people expect insects to be outside and not necessarily in their homes. But in the landscape, even if people only want the beneficial insects, they are still going to need some of the pest insects that feed on the plants. So there's food there for those beneficial insects. So IPM is going to use multiple control strategies, and we are looking on preventing pest problems from really reaching high levels. And so that is why monitoring is really going to be a very important part of an IPM program. So when you are talking with your customers or you are selling a service to people, you need to talk to them about how monitoring is playing in on this because that can be a large part of this program and it may be sometimes the only thing that you may do at your customers. It may be that you don't need to do a treatment, but you can give them an inspection report and that can provide them with information that they need to do to help you with that pest management program. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, IPM programs do rely a lot on prevention. And so that's gonna be a main part of what we talk about today. So these are gonna be things, and we'll talk more about each of these as we go on, cultural controls, structural modifications, sanitation, which is fancy word for cleaning, biological controls, barriers, pest resistant varieties of plants, and many other things. We're also going to talk about monitoring, which is regularly checking, as well as identifying problems that you might see in the landscape or in the home and communicating that with your customers so they actually know how to work with you on this IPM management program. You really want them to buy in, so they're gonna help you correct any conducive conditions. We also need to think about assessments when we are talking about IPM programs. 
that's where you're going to set a threshold of some sort. And it may not be you necessarily setting that threshold. It may be that the customer is setting that threshold. And that's really going to vary a lot of times from customer to customer, as well as maybe certain areas. You can have some customers that are okay with insects being out in the landscape because, you know, that's where insects tend to live. But they may not be okay with those same insects moving indoors. And so that may be their threshold. They're fine outside, not when they come inside. There are other people that are okay with some level of insects indoors, or there may be people that don't want insects anywhere. Um, while you would probably need to communicate with those people that insects are part of our world and that we need to have insects in there because they do beneficial things such as controlling other insects and pollinating plants, um, you know, communicate with them which ones that they may need to be concerned about versus ones that really aren't a big deal or may even be beneficial to certain areas. The next step is going to be essentially taking action in some way. And this may be something that you write on a report that your customer needs to fix. That could be something about like if you're in a house, maybe if they have a door threshold that is not sealed properly or the weather stripping around a door is not sealed properly, they may need to replace that. Or if that's a service that your company offers, then you can also get a sale from that. So it may be something that they need to do that you would communicate with them, or it could be something that you need to do. And that could be knocking down spider webs with some sort of a broom. It could be um, vacuuming up large amounts of insects. If you have a cockroach problem someplace indoors, then getting rid of those cockroaches is really an important thing. And a lot of people will rely on baiting which is a great way to manage cockroaches. But if you need to reduce levels fast, vacuuming a bunch of those cockroaches up and then putting out the bait can really help to reduce that population quickly so those customers can see results. So what action are you going to take? And make sure that you carry that out according to labeled instructions and following any safety precautions for yourself and your customers. The last part is something that is going to really be important um, for communication on your part with the customer, as well as record keeping, and that is reassessment. So this way you can go back over those records and make sure that whatever you did, did it work? Did it not work? Is there something that you need to do differently next time? If you were baiting only for cockroaches, maybe try adding in the vacuuming first and then baiting and seeing if that works better next time. So always kind of keep that in the back of your mind so you are working to improve the way that you are providing service for your customers. So monitoring, like I said, is a huge part of IPM programs. And when we are looking at monitoring, whether you are indoors or outdoors, you need to locate where those pest species are. And that's going to allow you to provide a more targeted treatment. You also need to look at the population size. That's going to help you figure out what level those insects are on your threshold and if you need to take action. If you have a single cockroach in a bathroom, is that a problem? Probably not, unless you have somebody who's really panicked about cockroaches. But if you have, especially one of the larger cockroaches, like a American cockroach or a smoky brown cockroach, those would be coming in from indoors typic or from outdoors typically. So if you have one of those just randomly in the house, it's probably something that just found its way in. So you might need to just communicate with the customer that they need to figure out ways that they need to exclude and keep those cockroaches outside. So population size is going to play into things because you need that to set those threshold levels. Conducive conditions are another thing that you need to keep an eye out for, and this is going to help you with communication with the customer. So you're going to need to tell them how they can help you with this IPM program by correcting 
those conducive conditions. And that can be anything from keeping firewood stacked against the house to fixing screens that have holes in them to trimming trees back that are overhanging the structure. So there's a whole bunch of stuff, but most customers don't understand that these can lead to insect problems. So they're going to rely on you as someone who's a professional and has experience in this to tell them this information so they can actually work on correcting it. Environmental conditions can also play into things. And again, this is going to be more so outdoors because we can't really control the weather, but it can also happen indoors. If you have areas of moisture inside, that can lead to various insect problems. If it's um, overwatering of houseplants, then people can start getting fungus snap problems and that can be an issue. So you would need to talk to your customer about reducing their watering schedule or turning on a fan while they're showering so they they don't have buildup of moisture in the bathroom areas. So there are different things that you can communicate. Outdoors, they may need to change watering or irrigation schedules. It may be that they need to turn over mulch to dry it out. So making sure that you're communicating that is very important. And then if you have large commercial accounts instead of just individual homes, it may be helpful to create some sort of a logbook where they can further help you by reporting what types of insects they're seeing in what areas. Because if you're talking about a large commercial account, you're only going to have so much time that you're going to be able to spend out there. And you are going to need to make sure that you're targeting those treatment areas where they actually are having problems instead of just kind of randomly going around and looking for everything yourself. It's going to be a more eyes on the situation if you provide somewhere for those customers to report those problems. So if you're looking indoors for insects, you're going to really need to look at food and water sources. And a lot of times this is going to lead you into kitchen and bathroom areas because that's typically where you're going to find food and water. Now, if they have teenagers like I do, then you might want to look underneath the teenager's bed because you're never going to understand what you find under there. It could be soda cans. It could be old sandwiches. You know, it all bets are off in that case. You also want to check out the garbage and recycling areas and make sure that those are going to be in areas where are, they're not going to be close to doors, because if so, that can lead those insects inside really quick. And then also, how are they cleaning those areas and is the garbage and recycling taken away on a regular basis? If there's snack machines or break rooms, that is another area that you can look for for different foods and waters. And then if you're in office buildings, you also need to keep in mind that people tend to keep snack items in their drawers of their desk. And that is going to be a possibility for insects getting in there as well. It's also a great idea to look in windowsills and light fixtures. A lot of insects are going to be attracted to light, and so they will be drawn to those particular areas. And if we're talking about commercial buildings, drop ceilings are another great place to look for stuff, not only insects, but also different types of rodents. So when you're looking around indoors, so you might need to take some tools with you. Traps are always great. Sticky traps are a great way to passively monitor a situation. And I think these are something that everybody should carry with them and make sure that you're putting them out so you can monitor the insects that are there because you can't be there all the time. But if you put out a sticky trap, the next time you go, it's like, oh, well, they're having problems with cockroaches now or spiders or whatever. So sticky traps are going to be important. A hand lens or a camera of some sort. Most people have a smartphone which has a camera on it these days. So that can allow you to zoom in on smaller things or even take a picture of something if you are not confident in identifying certain things yourself. You also, if you want, and I would suggest this being an entomologist, because sometimes camera pictures make it difficult to identify things. Having collecting equipment with you is also a good idea. Some soft forceps and either, you know, zip top baggies or disposable containers of some sort 
to throw a few of the insects or droppings or whatever in so it can be identified later on can be very helpful in some cases. A flashlight is another one. A lot of times the lighting in places isn't so great. So having a light source is going to be very important. And if you do rodent work, it may also be a good idea to have a black light function on that flashlight as well. A screwdriver is another great one. This can help you to remove outlet covers if you need to dust or access different little tiny spaces where ants or cockroaches might be. And then you can also use the end of that to tap to look for hollow spaces or dry wood termite pellets or things like that. When we're looking outdoors, again, we want to look in garbage areas and recycling areas if they have those outside as well. Definitely around the foundation. And as you can see in the upper picture there, that can be somewhat challenging depending on the vegetation that they have. In my experience, they usually have holly bushes planted right up against the foundation, which makes inspection very difficult and um, not too appetizing to do. You also, if you can look in the gutter areas, the bottom left-hand picture there shows you some gutters that need to be cleaned. And this is gonna be great harborage for all sorts of things like cockroaches and mosquitoes, which nobody really wants around their house. And the other thing that I do want to point out, it may be helpful to sometimes go out to accounts that may be having certain problems at night and looking at the lighting. Are they essentially drawing insects into where the doors are by having the lighting essentially act as a runway for an airplane? And if their lighting is not directed away from the structure, then it's going to bring those insects in and make it really easy for them to be drawn to those door areas, which can then lead them indoors. So outdoors, we're going to use a lot of the same tools that you may use inside. The sticky traps are going to look a little bit different, and you typically will hang them from vegetation or stake them to the ground. We also can use flushing agents. You can also use those indoors too. That's usually something like PI. Um, but outdoors, a lot of times you can use soapy water on turf and that can irritate the exoskeleton of the insects and bring them to the surface so they can actually then be seen and figure out what they are. Because some of the insects that you get as turf problems are going to only come out at night. And so unless you're out there monitoring at nighttime, it could be difficult to find them. A hand lens, again, is going to be helpful or a camera of some sort. You also want some sort of a knife or cutting tool when you're outdoors. You may need to cut sections of the turf to look in the root zone for grub problems. So it's helpful to have something to do that. And then again, collection containers, soft forceps, and then you may also want a field guide. I wouldn't carry one in your pocket, but you can certainly have one in your truck. So when we're looking indoors, you want to place your sticky traps in logical places. So when you're doing this, you want to really essentially think like a bug. They're going to like darker locations. They tend to follow edges. They will go sometimes in drop ceilings if you have commercial accounts with those. They will use those to get around or even wall voids and the pipes and wall voids. So it may be that they're moving around in areas that you aren't necessarily looking at or seeing. If you're talking about looking in kitchen areas, think about where it's warm and where is that food water available. So if you're talking about commercial kitchens, a lot of times this is going to be around the dishwashing unit. They can be in drop ceilings above that because that is providing steam and releasing that heat and so that could be a real cozy area for them to be in. They can also get into drains in commercial kitchens, so you definitely wanna pop the tops on those and take a look if you have access because sometimes you can't get those floor drains up. When you're placing out sticky traps, whether it's in a commercial account or a residential account, label and date the traps. Label them with the location, that way you can know if they've moved around or not, or if you have to take them back to the office, you know where those insects are from that particular trap. So label your traps, put a date on them, and then if you have larger accounts, you can create a map 
and put the trap placement on those. If you have a drop ceiling and you're putting traps in the drop ceiling, you can get little round dot stickers and stick those on the drop ceiling tiles where those traps are. That way you know where they are, but other people that see those dots really have no idea what's going on. So it's a easy way for you to cue in on where you place those. And if you need a map of an area, if you ask the commercial building for their fire escape plan, that is going to essentially provide you with a map of that structure that you can then utilize to put your traps on. And essentially when we're talking about outdoors, this is going to essentially be the same thing. Think like a bug, figure out where they're gonna be. They are going to, again, follow edges and walls and lines, but those lines can be a little bit different than when you are talking about indoors. This could be the foundation of a building. It could be a sidewalk. It could be a driveway. It could be a flower bed. It could be a garden hose that is running through the uh, yard. It could be irrigation lines. So where is food? Where is water? Where is shelter? And if you have somebody, the, the middle picture on the right hand side, if you have an account that has the ivy, like you see, that is going to be a great habitat for multiple things. I always cringe when I see this um, because I always think there's tons of cockroaches in there. There's tons of ants in there. There could be rodents in there. And it's a great way for those insects to get close to a building and then find their way in. So it's it's great for you guys if you're actually seeing that because that just means more business for you. But you just need to make sure that you are aware that that could be habitat for a variety of insects. So when you're inspecting, um, it's important to do it properly. You need to actually get up close and personal with stuff and really figure out what you're dealing with. And I'm not saying you have to go over every single inch of the landscape or the structure, but you do need to look where those insects are going to be. So on plants, a lot of times they're gonna be on the under surface of the leaf. So that means that you're gonna to need to turn those leaves over, or you may need to look along the stems or even at the base of the plant and move some of the mulch around. Indoors, cracks and crevices in dark areas, underneath stoves, washing machines, things like that. Those are typically going to be areas that those insects are hiding because they don't like being out in the open. So when you're identifying things, it's important if you're going to do it yourself that you use a field guide, which you have the MPMA field guide that's available either as a book or now they have the application that you can utilize as well. If you go online or you have someone local, if you go with the extension service in your area, then a lot of those will have entomologists that may be able to help you identify things. So this is where your phone camera can come in handy. You can take pictures of stuff, but when you're doing that, as an entomologist, I get a lot of things submitted to me, and it's important to have a size reference in your picture. And it may be that you don't necessarily carry around a tape measure like you see in the right-hand picture, but if you have a coin that you keep in your pocket that you can throw down in the picture to show size of something, that can be very helpful. And you want something like a coin or a ruler or tape measure to be put into the picture for size reference, because otherwise, if you put your hand or a paper clip, there are various sizes, and so we have really no idea what size the thing is. Something else that you can collect other than the insects themselves to bring in, you can also collect um, damage or the waste, also called frass, and a lot of times we can identify things from that as well. So. The more information you provide us, the easier it is for us to identify things and help you. So when you're doing this, you can either do this yourself or you bring the samples in. And some of these are gonna be tiny, tiny, tiny insects. And it may be that we need to use a microscope to identify them. So some things that you can use online, if you want, you can get a, an account with iNaturalist and get things identified on there. 
or you can look on Bug Guide, which is a website that has lots of pictures of insects. Uh, other options are hooking up with your local extension entomologist and getting them to identify things. I highly recommend that you um, create relationships with those people so they can help you out when you need it. Another idea is the application Google Lens that is on your phone. It's not perfect, but it can help you sometimes narrow down what things are. The other big one when you're identifying things is knowing why insects are present. Are they there actually causing an issue or are they there helping possibly? So some examples that you see on this slide, we have two outdoor examples and then an indoor example. Starting from the left, we have an ant that is essentially minding its own business. That's not the problem. It is tending to immature leaf hoppers, and the leaf hoppers are going to be feeding on the plant, causing damage, and also creating honeydew, which is a sticky, sweet substance that they excrete. The ants are actually going to be there to get the honeydew. So they are kind of a secondary problem. The main problem there is controlling those leaf hoppers that are causing damage to the plant. The middle picture that you see there is an assassin bug, and that one's eating either a bee or a fly. I can't tell which. And with assassin bugs, a lot of people see them because they're fairly large and pretty noticeable, and they panic because they kind of have large piercing sucking mouth parts and people kind of get freaked out. But they're actually predators and they can be beneficial in the landscape. So that may be something that you need to talk to your customers. Hey, that's a good one. You want to keep those when you see them. And then the one on the right is one of my personal favorites because I love cockroaches. And that is actually an ensign wasp. And Usually when people call me about these, they say that they have a weird looking housefly in their home. And it's usually an ensign wasp. So they have these little tiny flag-like abdomens. You see those big, long back legs. And they kind of hover around. They fly a little bit, but they kind of walk around. That is a signal that they have a cockroach issue because those are actually a wasp that lay their eggs in the cockroach egg cases. And so those are a control essentially for the cockroach and they are beneficial to have around. So if you see ensign wasps in an environment or your customer is seeing them, you need to go out and you need to look and resolve the cockroach issue. So less than 5% of insect species are pests, which is a very, very small amount, but those are the ones that everybody complains about. So moving into the different types or um, let's see, strategies of IPM, the first one is gonna be cultural controls. So this is where a lot of the preventative stuff is going to be. And we are essentially modifying normal care to the landscape or structure to reduce or avoid pest problems. So when we're talking about indoors, a lot of this is going to rely on sanitation. So making sure that people are vacuuming, mopping, cleaning up spills, uh, making sure that they don't have, like you see in the middle there, the giant container of plastic bags, because that is great harborage area for German cockroaches. Uh, making sure that they don't leave dishes in the sink at night. If you And I know that that doesn't sound like a big deal and people are just like, oh, well, it's not that bad of a deal. There's just some crumbs. Well, crumbs for us are nothing. But if you think about crumbs for ants or cockroaches, that's a meal. So it's a lot easier for them to feed on those little tiny bits of food that we just kind of blow off. The other thing, making sure that any infested food is discarded and they may need to make sure that they're getting through their food on a regular basis because sometimes you have that, I don't know, bag of flour that's in the back of the pantry that you forgot about. And next thing you know, you have pantry pests. 
So you also need to look at the way that they are taking out garbage and recycling, making sure that garbage cans, both indoors and outdoors, which we'll talk about in a minute, have lids on them indoors that they are using garbage can liners. And then the big thing that a lot of people don't do is even if you're using a garbage bin liner, Somehow there's always stuff that kind of leaks out. You get a small hole in the bag and you get that drippy stuff. And then the goopy stuff kind of builds up on the bottom. So I recommend at least quarterly that people will clean out their garbage and recycling bins with, you know, soapy water or a disinfectant spray or something like that, just to get all that gunk out of there. That way they are actually going to uh, not have that sitting in there for the insects to eat. If you can encourage people to rinse their recyclables before they put them into the recycling bin, that kind of makes it cleaner for everything. And then drains can be a big problem, whether this is in homes or commercial accounts, um, more so in commercial accounts in my experience. But if you have drains that aren't utilized on a regular basis, you want to make sure that they are being flushed with water to keep water in the pee traps so things can't come through there. And then if they're putting any sort of organic matter down in there, like a garbage disposal or in a commercial kitchen, a lot of times they just hose down everything into the drain. And so you get that organic matter buildup. It's very important to get rid of that or that can lead to small fly problems. So you need to take a stiff brush or they need to take a stiff brush and clean out that drain. And that's essentially dislodging that kind of slime layer that builds up on the drain. And then you want to flush that with boiling water. If you have drains, especially in commercial areas, <laughs> that you can't get the lid off to use the stiff brush and boiling water method, there are treatments that you can do with drain gels and whatnot that break down that organic layer, or there are also pesticide treatments that you can use. Outdoors, when we're talking about cleaning things up, this is going to mainly focus on removing thick vegetation, pruning that stuff away from the house, whether those are trees that are touching or overhanging the structure that can be used as a way to get in there removing anything that might be stacked up against the building. A lot of times this may be uh, firewood. If you're talking about a home, they like that firewood right against the house, right by the back door. And that just allows those insects to move in to those spaces more rapidly. If they're having problems with moisture insects like fungus gnats or springtails, then turning over mulched areas and changing the watering schedule is going to be important. And then also I mentioned earlier about cleaning gutters out on a regular basis. That way you don't have buildup of matter in there leading to cockroach or mosquito problems. So you also want to, especially at this time of year, make sure that you are over or reducing overwintering locations of pests because this is going to help you later on the following year. So you also want to make sure that weeds are taken care of that way that they are not there for those insects to feed on in the early season because a lot of times those insects will start out first feeding on weeds and then they move into the landscape. And any time that you are working, whether it's indoors or outdoors, and you're reaching into areas that you don't know what might be in there, wear gloves. That way you are protecting yourself from anything that can bite or sting you. All right, mechanical control. This is, in my opinion, one of the fun parts of an IPM program. This is use of labor and materials, excluding pesticides and different types of machinery to reduce your pest population. So this could be excluding the pests both indoors and out and using things like traps and vacuums. So when we're talking about exclusion outdoors, this is really going to prevent those from moving in through doors, windows, cracks. And exclusion outdoors, if you look at the dumpsters there, those are, in my opinion, perfect dumpsters because one, 
the lids are closed, which you don't often see with dumpsters. And two, the dumpsters are away from the building, which you also don't often see with dumpsters. So that is beautiful, in my opinion. You want to have those lids closed to keep any of the pests out. You also want to look at screening around your buildings. Are those screens in good repair? If they aren't, then you either need to, you know, have a handyman service come out and do that, or you need to have your customer hire somebody. So replacing the screen or using patch kits to make sure that things can't get in. Sealing around any pipe wire penetrations is going to be very important. And depending on what part of the country you're in, you may need to use different materials for this. I know I, I'm located in Texas, and so we have anywhere from you know really, really hot summers to really cold winters. Well, what we call really cold winters where it just gets kind of freezing. But when you're talking about temperature extremes, you have to make sure that you have something that's going to expand and contract with those temperatures. And so make sure when you're sealing around those areas that you're using something that's going to work long-term and not crack itself in a very short period of time. Weep holes are another big one that we really need to look at. If you have a building that has a brick or a stone facade on it, it will have weep holes and that is necessary for air movement to go in and out of the wall voids. But that is also a way that pests can get into the building. So you want to do something with those weep holes. You can either put copper mesh in there and there are also weep hole covers that you can purchase and stick in there. Some people will also use steel wool, which is what you see in this picture right here. But steel wool will only work if, one, it's hidden um, or if it doesn't get water on the building. If the irrigation system gets that area wet, then that steel wool will rust and that can cause staining. So if you don't want that to happen to your customer's building, then you may want to use something like a weep hole cover or a copper mesh. Then I talked about excluding them. So we talked about this in sanitation, but it also works for exclusion as well because you are, when you're trimming the trees back from the structure so they can't overhang or touch the roof, then that's excluding those insects from being able to use those to get onto the roof area. So it actually fits into two categories. And then inspecting things, when things are brought in to a building, and this isn't always easy to do, having that inspected to make sure that people are not bringing them in with them, any insect pests. This can be very important if people are buying furniture secondhand or they're going to thrift stores, um, not having them bring those bed bugs into the structure. That can also be very problematic with homeless shelters a lot of times because things can get passed around and that can cause them to have further issues. So maybe setting something up, a program where they go through an inspection process may be helpful to reduce those problems from being reintroduced over and over. And then sealing off vent covers that are in the attics of buildings. There are going to be things in there that are for ventilation, which is important but it can also allow animals, whether they're small mammals or arthropods of some sort to get in through those structures. So making sure that you have those sealed off to keep those things out is gonna be important. When we're talking about exclusion indoors, this can be something as simple as storing things like food or other items in plastic sealed containers. So here you can see a pantry area where they're actually storing their food in those areas. Pet food is a big one. Another one is bird seed. Encourage your customers to store that stuff in sealed containers to keep the um, insect or pantry pests, stored product pests, whatever you wanna call them, out of those particular items. If you're storing things in 
shelving that does not have kind of stuff where it can fall through, you want to make sure that you're sealing any of those cracks and crevices with a sealant. That way you don't have buildup of material in those cracks leading to insect problems. We already talked about garbage bins, both indoors and outdoors, having lids and then indoors also having liners. So the lid on the garbage can is going to exclude those pests from getting into there. Then storing things in the freezer, this could work for both commercial as well as individual accounts. If they're closed in shop for long periods of time, then you can stick those things in the freezer so you don't have stuff hatching out while they are not there. If they don't want to st um, store things in plastic containers like you saw on the first picture and they're putting them in attics or something like that, if they're using cardboard boxes, making sure that all of the edges and um, connections are sealed with tape is going to be important to keep things like spiders and scorpions out of it while it's in storage. And then if they're ripening fruit, if they don't want to do that in the refrigerator, then they can put things in a paper bag with a clip on it and leave it on the counter. And that can help keep away the small flies such as fruit flies from getting to that fruit. When we're talking about doors, you really need to look about um, around the door from the inside when it's light outside. And you're gonna look essentially for daylight. So this door looks fine from a distance. But if you look up close, it actually has a gaping hole at the bottom of it. And so that door sweep would actually need to be replaced. That way it's going to keep out insects and rodents. This one is a interior door on a home. So you can see the daylight there that needs the weather stripping to be replaced. And so that can either, again, be a service that you decide to provide, or it could be something that you recommend your customers get done. If you're talking about commercial buildings, they can either use the door flaps like you see here, or they can use air curtains to keep things out. The big key here is that they actually turn those on and make sure that they're being utilized because a lot of times I see air curtains that they have them, but they don't actually have them turned on and that's not going to do anything. So when we're talking about more mechanical things, there are a lot of devices on there, things like fly papers. We already talked about sticky traps for indoors and outdoors, but we also have rat traps, mice traps. We have pheromones that we can add to the sticky traps that will actually attract the insects in and not passively trap them. And then we also have vacuums that can be utilized both indoors and outdoors. There are specialized vacuums that you can buy that suck up insects for when you're using it for field crops and stuff. But if you're talking about your stuff on your truck, you may just want to get a rechargeable handheld vacuum and you can actually suck bugs off of the plant or from inside the house. And again, that's gonna reduce that population very rapidly. And so your customers were gonna see good results. There are also various fruit fly traps that you can put out in kitchens. There are fly lights, either homeowner, like you see in the upper right-hand corner there, or there are the larger commercial lights that you can utilize. Just make sure that you're placing those in areas that it's going to be conducive for them capturing those insects. And then the big one that I see on a lot of people's trucks are the Webster things that they utilize to knock down cobwebs and spiders and other types of insects. And these are, a, it's kind of a great thing that people do this when they go into accounts because it's kind of like an add-on. They don't really, I don't expect people to remove my cobwebs in the corners, but you know, it's always a, a bonus in my opinion. So that's a great thing. Not only is it seen as a kind of an add-on service to what you do, but you're also removing those uh, insects and arthropods from those areas. So outdoors using mulch is going to actually help reduce weeds that are popping up. It can improve the soil. It can hold in moisture. It's going to reduce the soil temperature. And that's going to help actually promote plant health. 
So that's a good sell for a program. If you're doing a landscape program for somebody, having them mulch in spring and fall can be beneficial to help build the health of that landscape. Again, you can use the vacuum. You can see the vacuum removing the bug from the picture in the top left-hand corner. And then another favorite of mine is high pressure water sprays. This works really great on small, soft-bodied insects. And if you have trees that are really tall, that it's not going to be feasible for you spraying those trees, and people are having aphid and honeydew problems, it may be that you could just go with a high pressure water spray. That way you don't have to worry about pesticidal drift. And that high pressure water is going to knock those aphids out of the tree as well as clean the honeydew off. So that can be an option to utilize as well. Physical control is going to be environmental manipulations that can indirectly control pest populations. So this would be things like altering light, humidity, and temperature. And this plays more so indoors than it does outdoors because it's easier to control the environment inside. So you can adjust the thermostat to control the temperature. You can use either humidifiers or dehumidifiers based upon the moisture requirements that you want. Mostly if you're dealing with indoor problems, then you're gonna use a dehumidifier because people are having problems with sosids or springtails or fungus gnats or something like that. Outdoors, you can use this as well. You can prune plants to thin out the vegetation and that can reduce the uh, number of mosquitoes that may be resting in vegetation during the day. You can also use things like reflective mulch in certain areas that will reduce populations that tend to stay on the undersurface of the leaf like aphids or whiteflies or thrips. The other physical controls that you can do that can actually kill insects are going to be heat and cold treatments. And those are typically going to be indoors for certain types of insects. And you do need specialized training and equipment to carry those treatments out. Biological control is another fun one. This is kind of a tough sell for people because they don't want you releasing more bugs into the environment to control the bugs that they already have. But biological control is something that happens naturally, both indoors and out. And these are going to be different biological organisms controlling those pests that we don't want. So conservation biological control is something that hopefully you are carrying out by utilizing the IPM program. And this can actually be a good selling point for IPM for your customers, because you can talk about how IPM and you utilizing IPM within the landscape is going to conserve those beneficial organisms because you are inspecting and treating the pests with reduced insect pesticides or reduced impact pesticides in the landscape and you're targeting those treatments to where the pests are located. That way it's going to help conserve or keep those beneficial organisms that are in the environment. The second one, which is augmentation biological control, that is when you start releasing things in the environment. And this, most people think, I, I don't want you releasing ladybugs or parasitic wasps or something in my yard. But this can also be using biological organisms like the BTI products. So those are used to control mosquitoes in standing water. That is a biological organism that you are releasing. So that is you augmenting stuff in that area. And then importation or classical, that's something that we do as uh, researchers where we will be trying to control invasive species by going to their native range and actually finding and locating predators and parasites and bringing those back. But for your purposes, biological control would be in the landscape helping people to conserve the beneficial organisms that are already there 
And then indoors, maybe encouraging people to be a little more tolerant to things that help them cut down on the pests that may be in their house. And that could be things like cobweb spiders, like you see in the bottom there. It could be geckos or anoles. It could be the ensign wasps if they have a cockroach problem. Just say, hey, those weird house flies, which they're not. Um, those are helping you control your cockroaches and those people may change their minds and think that those are a little more okay. So the last thing that I want to mention is when you're talking about IPM, like I said at the very beginning, IPM does include pesticides, but when we are using those pesticides, we need to make sure that we are using them in the proper manner and making wise choices. So all pesticides, regardless of whether they are naturally derived coming from a plant or they're created in a laboratory based upon um, hormones of an insect, they all need to be used with caution. And they are a pesticide, which means that they are essentially there to kill some sort of a pest. So that means that you need to always read and follow the labeled instructions. You need to choose a targeted pesticide if you can, especially in the landscape if you're dealing with caterpillars. We have things like BT Kerstaki that targets only caterpillars. Or we have spinosad products that is another naturally derived product and that one targets stuff that eats or has chewing mouth parts. So it can conserve some of those beneficial organisms. So those two have to be ingested for them to work. So you can help to keep those beneficials in the environment. So choose a targeted pesticide if you can. And I'm not saying that you can't use broad spectrum pesticides because those can be utilized as well, but you want to target your treatment areas too. So indoors, cracks and crevices underneath stuff, you know, target where those insects are going to be. Outdoors, same thing. Where are the insects located? It may be that they're in the Asian jasmine that is growing everywhere. So you may need to treat that area and you don't have to treat absolutely the whole entire property. So target the area where they're going to be finding food, water, and harborage. So low impact pesticide options, we have things like insecticide or insect growth regulators. And these are typically bait products. So baits for ants, termites, cockroaches, things like that. So they can be used both indoors and outdoors based upon which products you're utilizing, but they are great options to actually think about. The microbial products, those are the BT products that are available for mosquitoes. You would use those against the immature stages of the mosquitoes that are in standing water. And then we also have the products that use against caterpillars. A word on the BT Kerstaki for caterpillars if you have customers that have a caterpillar problem, but they also have a butterfly garden, the BT is not going to differentiate between caterpillars that people want dead and caterpillars that they want to keep alive because they want them to turn into butterflies. So make sure that you are targeting that particular area that they want the caterpillars dead and you be very careful about any product drift. Some other naturally dry products, we have things like soaps. We have the botanical products, which are plant-based. A lot of the botanical products, even though they are naturally derived and come from a plant, they are also going to be broad spectrum. And that means that they can kill both pests and beneficials. So again, you need to pay attention to what that label is and know a little bit more about the pesticides that you are utilizing. So when we're talking about customer communication, it may be good for you to have some materials to leave them or some websites that they can go to get more information. 
It may be that they need a checklist of tasks. Here's what I need you to help me with on this IPM program. And that could be anything from moving a firewood pile from the back door to a further area in the yard to fixing weather stripping or trimming trees. You may need to have pamphlets demonstrating certain techniques and explaining why you are wanting them or asking them to do this and how that's going to help. It also can be helpful, especially in commercial accounts, to have those diagrams of the structure. So you can point out the areas where you're seeing issues and that can help you better communicate where they need to look and where they need to fix conducive areas. And then it may be that you need to provide them with information on the insects that they have actually in the area and that way they can help you identify problems. Record keeping is going to be a very large part of the program. Make sure that you use products and you're obviously you have to keep records of what products you're using, but you also need to watch trends that you see in the area. What pests are you finding? What location? Is it the same pest that you're finding over and over and over in one area? If that's the case, then why is that pest always in that area? What can be fixed to change that, that they are not going to then be able to find food, water, or a place to live? Did the customer carry out the recommendations that you have given them? And this, I know, is a tough sell for me saying this to people that make their livelihood by treating accounts for money. But if you have a customer who refuses to work with you and they are constantly complaining about how you do not fix their insect problems, but they continue to have the door wide open and the dumpster is right outside, they're gonna keep on having problems and then they're gonna keep blaming you. So do you need to have that customer then, you know, leaving a bad review or saying that you're not fixing their problem, you know, if they're not helping you with this IPM program and they're not cooperating by doing their part, then you might want to reconsider them as a customer. They really need to sign on to this IPM program with you and work to carry out all parts of the program. So this is my contact information. If you want more information or just want to geek out about bugs like I do, we have two podcasts that we do. Bugs by the Yard is all things bugs in the landscape. And Unwanted Guests is going to deal with structural pests. Not only bugs there, we've also talked about rats and bats and various other things. I also do short video clips called Backyard Bug Hunt. And those are posted on my Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube page. And then if you want more information or if you need insects identified because you don't have access to an entomologist, please feel free to email me at ebrown at ag.tamu.edu. Thank you so very much for listening.